Hello and Namaste. Welcome to the Veterinary Student for Animal Welfare's webinar. Today's topic is Welfare Consideration of Captive Primates. During the first half hour, everyone except the speaker and moderator will be muted. Question can be asked at any time in the chat box and the speaker will do her best to enter during the session. And as well, we'll have some time for live Q&A at the end. The recorded version of this webinar will be available on our YouTube channel by the end of this week. Today's speaker is Dr. Inga McDormand. Dr. McDormand, BBMS, Bachelor of Veterinary Medicine and Surgery, MRCVS, member of the Royal College of Veterinary Surgeon, has been working as a small animal vet for the past 20 years. Dr. McDormand is also the clinical director of the One Health Foundation and has been providing trainings through the One Health Foundation for the last three years. So without delay, let's welcome Dr. Inga McDormand. Dr. Inga, Thank the you floor much, is Ina. yours. Um, um, some of you I, you know, I will have met before um, during some of the training programs in Nepal. Um, to anyone that doesn't know me, just to reiterate what Ina said there, um, particularly in relation to this uh, presentation, which is on um, a little bit of wild animal welfare. Um, I am a small animal vet, so I'm certainly not a wildlife vet. Um, but I have been studying a Master of Veterinary Science in Conservation Medicine. And during that course, we did study some captive animal wel wel welfare, which is what we're going to talk about today. So um, we'll just run through a few of the first slides. There are a number of um, references that we make in this presentation, and I have included some reference slides at the end. So anything that you're interested in, there are um, references that you can, can relay back to further down the line. Okay. Okay, so during this presentation, um, we're going to discuss the wildlife considerations of captive primates, and particularly in relation to the primate pet trade. So we'll review some of the current situation of that trade, We'll then go on to discuss some of the welfare assessment of captive wildlife and consider some of the legal welfare and disease risks associated with keeping primates as pets. We'll then have a quick chat about some of the cultural impacts associated with pet primates and their use as a commodity. And then some discussions towards what the future holds for these animals. So when we talk about measuring animal welfare, Animal welfare can range from being very good to very poor and is an assessment of an individual's state in response to their attempt to cope with the environment that they have been provided. Welfare not only measures health, but encompasses the physical, mental, behavioral and pathological responses to that animal's successful or unsuccessful attempts at managing their environmental stress. Sorry, just jumped on there. So one thing I thought was just really important to clarify, um, obviously you are a student animal welfare group, and I'm sure that a number of you will have quite strong ethical beliefs about whether animals should be used in certain situations. Now, welfare is different from ethics, okay? So when we talk about animal welfare, we are concerned with that animal having a good life for the duration of its life, and that when it comes to the end of its life, that its death is humane, okay? Ethics is something different, which considers the morality of the uses of animals. And it is accepted that although it's complex, animal welfare can be measured scientifically. And there's also consensus that no single measurement, but a combination of measures should be considered together. And my reason just for highlighting that is as, as veterinary surgeons, which, which certainly many of us, if not all of us here today are, um, we will be faced with situations where we may have ethical views and not feel that the use of animals fit with our own ethics and morals. But as veterinary surgeons, we still are able to make an impact on the welfare for those animals. So I just wanted to highlight that because we sometimes are faced with, with difficult, difficult situations. So just to run through a little bit of background on the current primates um, situation. So unsustainable, unsustainable trade is a major conservation challenge of wildlife and the international primate trade peaked in the 1950s to 1970s, 
mainly to supply the demand for the pharmaceutical industry. And at that time, tens of thousands of primates were caught annually. The mass international trade has reduced in recent decades, and there has been more of a shift towards the use of captive bred individuals. And there also has been a change in the species demand. From in the 90s, it was mainly orangutans and langurs, which were the most popular. Um, currently, it's uh, macaques and slow loris that are making up the bulk of the primate trade. The Born Free Foundation estimates that there are up to 5,000 pet primates in the UK currently, and they also have registered up to one um, welfare concern call per week. Okay. Many of the major, major animal charities have a position statement that the keeping of primates as domestic pets is, is unsuitable. Okay. And some of that uh, demand for having pet primates has been influenced by celebrity influence over time. Uh, Michael Jackson very famously had a pet chimpanzee named Bubbles, which he, he regularly would appear and be photographed with. And that, that's continued on more recently. People like Justin Bieber have, have been photographed with, with their pet primates as well. And this does have an influence on their popularity. So there is some legal protection of primates, and what I'm going to discuss here is mainly the, the UK um, situation, but it's just to give you a bit of background on, on what protection is available. In 1979, the Five Freedoms List was created by the Farm Animal Welfare Council. So primarily, these guidelines were created with, with farm animals in mind. This has been developed further into what we call the five welfare domains, which I'll explain a little bit more about. And it now extends beyond the scope of farm animals. In the UK, primates are protected under the Animal Welfare Act of 2006. Now, this act means that owners can not only be prosecuted for harming an animal, but can also be prosecuted for what we call a failure to act. So if there is any failing to adequately provide for that animal or meet their needs, that can actually be prosecuted. A code of practice has been produced by DEFRA, which um, stands for the Department of Environment, Food and Rural Affairs. And this details what primates needs are. And again, I have attached a link to this at the end. There's further protection offered by the Dangerous Wild Animal Act. And on this act, um, certain primates have to actually be licensed for ownership. And that comes with added protection that um, inspection of premises can actually be carried out as well um, in accordance to renewing that license. Unfortunately, as good as that sounds, that system is, is not complete in that pet stores are exempt. So some pet stores that may supply these exotic animals are exempt from that inspection. And not all primates fall under the, the guise either of that. The international primate trade is regulated by CITES, um, which is the Convention of International Trade of Endangered Species. CITES paperwork is not um, essential for ownership, um, but sales certificates are recommended were you to undergo one of these inspections. And I didn't know if any of you might have attended the Asia for Animals conference that was held in Kathmandu. Um, there was a speaker there from the non-human rights project. So I thought some people might be interested just to know a little bit about them. Um, they have actually offered legal representation to a number of animal welfare cases and actually had one of the first cases brought to court um, against two um, research chimpanzees named Leo and Hercules. And there was actually a legal case, which is still ongoing, um, basically dealt with them being kept against their will in a captive environment. So very much viewing those primates as, as sentient beings. Okay. So just to review, hopefully you're all familiar with the five freedoms. Okay, but we'll just run over that very quickly. So these, just to be clear, are the minimum set of requirements that should be provided for any animal on, under human care. And the first one is freedom from hunger and thirst. So that involves the provision of a suitable diet and, and free access to water, obviously. Freedom from discomfort, which is the provision of shelter and an environment suitable for that animal. Freedom from pain, injury or disease by providing medical care. And then freedom to express normal behavior. So that requires sufficient space, facilities, 
and appropriate company of what we call conspecifics, which are other animals of the same kind. And then there is the final one, which is freedom of fear and distress at any point during their life. So provision of conditions which avoid any kind of mental suffering. So as I said, this has now been developed on further to the five welfare domains. And this little chart was produced by Wild Welfare, um, which I've just added the link to there. So it follows a similar, similar um, list there, where the first four physical domains are concerned with our biological function and our physical well-being. So again, nutrition, environment, you know, our physical parameters there. There also is a fifth domain which has been extended into covering more of the mental state of the animal, and that deals with psychological well-being. Okay. So some of the negative experiences that might contribute to poor psychological well-being, as well as fear and pain that we discussed with the five freedoms. We now also have um, more psychological needs like boredom, frustration and anger. And they could be improved upon with that animal's environment to create more positive experiences with goal-directed engagement, um, companionship, which can make animals feel much more secure and uh, encourage their natural curiosities. So when we look at the ass assessment of welfare in captive wild animals, there are two main things that we can measure. There are the physiological measurements, which are the things that as, as vets we're quite familiar with. So our body condition, skin condition, the presence of any injury or disease, any lameness or confirmation problems. Then there are our stress re responses. So these are our fight or flight responses. And animals under stress, as they're you know, designed to deal with stress in their natural env environment, so if they were under threat from any predators or anything, we would see an increase in heart rate and respiratory rate. So these are measurable responses. And we can also actually see um, stress stimulation at, at the level of the adrenal glands with a cortisol release. And this is something that can actually be measured um, to, to different degrees of effectiveness in wild animals as well. Something important just to point out about stress response, fight or flight responses are designed to be a short term emergency response. So if an animal is kept chronically in a stressful condition, or if this exceeds their ability to cope, then it can start to produce negative effects, reducing their fitness, immune status, and reproductive abilities, and in very extreme cases could even result in death. Okay. Now, the other things that we can measure which are more to, to do with the psychological than physiological are our behavioural measures. Um, one part of that is activity time budgets, which is the amount of time an animal would spend doing normal behaviours. And I'll touch on that a little bit more in a further slide. Um, measuring abnormal behaviours, so what we call stereotypical behaviours, which we'll have a little bit of explanation on later, and also what we call preference tests. Now, if we don't know what an animal wants, um, the easiest thing would be to be able to ask it what it wants. Now, obviously, they can't tell us, but what we can do is we can offer them a choice. So we can give animals a choice of you know, either bedding type, food type or the way in which they manage their food and um, the company of others or isolation and we can actually measure which of those they tend to gravitate towards and also whether their physiological and behavior responses are better in one situation or another and that's a way that we can measure um, welfare and also how we can measure improvements to welfare as well. So this is just, we won't go through all of this, but it's just to go through how we actually look at those measurements we've spoken about. So with our physical state, which we're probably all quite familiar with, um, absence of disease, lameness, body weight and condition, our physiological state, which are our actual measurements, so our heart rate, respiratory rate, and in some situations, the cortisol levels. And then our psychological state, which is more um, to do with actual behaviours um, or indeed withdrawal from normal behaviours. Okay. So we mentioned the activity time budgets. Now, this is something very important, both when we're talking specifically today about kind of pet primates 
um, but also for any wildlife which is kept captive. So in any you know, zoo or wildlife reserve settings, this is something really important. And a good knowledge of the species, their normal behavior and activity time budgets in the wild is really fundamental to producing good welfare. So for example, um, if you know that an animal would normally spend six hours of their day on feeding activities, and you provide all of the food in a bowl, 10 minutes time, and they eat it all, they then have almost six hours of that day to fill, okay? Um, so things that we can do to improve upon that are, you know, providing foraging opportunities, hiding food, um, food puzzles, you know, things that stimulate the animals mentally, um, to try and fit more with their normal time activities in the wild. The other thing specifically for um, primates is they spend a lot of time with uh, social groups. So they spend a lot of time with conspecifics and engaging in group activities like grooming, which the, the pictures on the, on the right show there. So again, if we know that that's part of their normal daily activity, the more that we can replicate that, the better. So species knowledge um, and activity time budgets can be improved with, with environmental enrichment. So a knowledge about the species allows us to try to create an environment best suited to their welfare needs. Okay. Now, I'm just going to see whether this video will play or not. Um, if, if it doesn't, I can share, share a recording of all of this with you later. This is made by the Born Free Foundation, and it basically shows some of the stereotypical behaviours that we mentioned. So I'll just see if it will play. So hopefully you can see this. This is an animal involved in some pacing activity. We can see it's in quite a small enclosure. There is some climbing um, environmental enrichment in there, but the animal is creating a repetitive behavior of pacing. Next one is some over -grooming. And the final one, we have rocking behaviour. Now, we can probably see this animal is in a very small enclosure, an empty enclosure, there's nothing else in it, it's on its own. And this animal is showing fairly, fairly extreme levels of, of psychological distress. Okay, this is not nice to see, um, and it's very abnormal behaviour. And it's a result of, of boredom. Okay. Again, here we have the normal grooming behaviour, but it's now being um, transferred onto an animal object because this little animal is not able to exhibit its normal social behaviours that it should be doing. So what we have here is some data from a document uh, called Primates as Pets. Is there a case for regulation? This was produced by the RSPCA, which is the Royal Society for Prevention of Cruelty to Animals in England and Wild Futures, and it was produced in 2012. So the chart on the left shows the breakdown of 280 pet primates in the UK. And these are um, calculations of which animals were licensed under that Dangerous Wild Animal Act. So that was the law which offered extra protection through licensing and inspections. And on that chart, um, lemurs, capuchins, and macaques represent over 75% of the pet licenses issued. The chart on the right is basically um, the breakdown of investigations of welfare reports to the RSPCA. And almost 50% of those calls were regarding marmoset monkeys. They're actually the most common um, primate pet in the UK, but unfortunately they fall under the radar of that Dangerous Wild Animal Act and don't require licensing. So it's just really to highlight, even when there are a lot of laws in place, um, the situation is, is far from perfect and there are gaps that animals do fall through. Okay. It's also been estimated that non-compliance with licensing could be anywhere as high as 85 to 90%. So the welfare concerns with keeping primates um, as, as actual pet animals 
there's kind of three main groups that we'll just run through. So first of all is the source of those animals. So there are three main sources to where primates could come from um, into the pet trade. So the first would be caught from the wild. The second is captive bred animals. And the third is a surplus to zoo, zoo requirements um, for their animals. Animals caught from the wild are almost always young animals and there normally does involve killing of the adult animals to source those babies, okay. Um, captive bred animals obviously has slightly less welfare concerns but there still is real concern over transportation and their needs being met, okay. The second major welfare concern of keeping pet primates is their social needs. Primates have evolved with um, very complex and codependent social needs, and they are group animals. And they have a long period of maternal dependency, and they also have a long period of learning from their, their mother and their social group. There's a paper I've attached, um, which is by Salisbury et al, 2009, and it investigated websites selling primates and found that 78% were selling individual animals and 63% were selling infants. So both of these go very much against the welfare needs, okay? And means that their strong requirement for social contacts and material dependency are not being met. And 61% of RSPCA investigations involve a, a solitary animal, okay? They also have very specific husbandry needs. So primates are, are a long lived species. They can live for a long time and their welfare needs also change and develop with age. And often this can extend beyond the interest of the keeper. You know, they're very keen at the beginning and then their interest may wane when they realize they have a, a long commitment to this animal. Many animals are surrendered in older age or once they reach puberty. They are highly intelligent species and they are capable of problem solving and have a real appreciation of self. So, you know, they are our closest relatives and they are highly, highly intelligent. They have very specialist husbandry needs and an appreciation of their normal behavior and those activity time budgets that we mentioned is, is poorly understood by many owners, meaning that many of these animals do not have um, their appropriate needs met and suffer poor welfare. And poor husbandry and diet can result in, in skeletal and metabolic abnormalities. And there also is a high risk of disease transfer as well between um, humans and primates. Failure to meet the welfare needs, as we saw, um, hopefully if you could see in the video, can basically um, result in these abnormal behaviors. So the little chart that's shown there is a range of behaviours which were shown in 17 pet monkeys, which were then surrendered to a, a rehabilitation rescue facility. And many of those animals actually displayed multiple of, of these abnormalities. So some that we saw in the video, you know, the pacing, self-harm, mesh biting, these are all behavioural stereotypies that have resulted from, from poor welfare. So we'll just speak a little bit more about the disease aspects. So most pathogens affecting people have, have originated from animals, okay? And keeping of pet primates can certainly pose a risk of both what we call zoonosis, which is the transfer of disease from animals to humans, and reverse zoonosis, which is in the other direction. So primates can actually catch diseases from us as well. Important emerging human diseases like monkeypox, Ebola and simian immunodeficiency virus have originated from primates and keeping primates in small conditions in a home environment alongside people um, do have a very high disease risk concern. Uh, diseases like measles, influenza and parainfluenza can be a risk for, for both the primates and for people. They can transfer in both directions. And one other um, major risk we see is odour directed aggression. So in the wild, particularly when primates reach puberty, they will normally start to display some aggression to others in the group, particularly the adults. And in a, in a pet situation when this cannot be done, that aggression can be directed towards the owner and in some cases can actually be quite, quite serious. 
And illegal wildlife trade is one of the major illegal trades in the world. And it results not only in unregulated movement of animals across the world, but it can also result in un unregulated risk transfer of disease. Um, and something we're, we're all currently seeing with the, you know, the current pandemic that we're going through. So there can be introdu introduction of novel disease, um, particularly in illegal trade, where that movement is, is not regulated or authorised. And there are other situations can actually be the introduction of invasive species. So there was a situation in Mauritius where unwanted pet macaque monkeys were released into the wild and are now considered an invasive species there and, and can risk novel pathogens to the, um, the traditional wildlife. So there are cultural impacts um, associated with primates. And the highest pet ownership of primates are in Asia, Africa, Central and South America. And some are kept as companions and others have high spiritual importance as well. We'll all probably be familiar with the, the encouragement and feeding of primates at temples and obviously the religious association that they have. And there are some situations where um, some primates are even kept in, in captivity at, in temples in relationship to, you know, to worship of, of Hanuman God. Um, there is a paper which was studied in Kathmandu by Jones Engel et al, 2006, and they studied primate diseases in the macaques um, at Swambuna Temple in Kathmandu and found um, evidence of herpes virus, retrovirus, uh, sorry, retroviruses, and also simian immunodeficiency virus. So again, there is, is risk of zoonosis and risk of global disease transfer at these popular tourist sites. So the, the keeping of primates and the keeping of pet primates can be extended further into that use of them actually as a, as a commodity. The attraction of primates, particularly in, in tourist areas, um, have provided an additional source of both tourism and income and they are now considered of, of economic importance in some cultures. In some cases, this is extended to ownership of a, of a working animal. Um, and normally, as the picture shows there, it can involve the humanizing of primates, dressing them in, in clothes and forcing them to perform tricks or to pose for, for photographs, which are then ex exchanged for money for, for the owner of that animal. In addition to all the welfare concerns that we've already discussed, um, this type of ownership is unfortunately often associated with, with tethering, as we can see in this picture, um, primate is being kept on a chain. And there are often some, some cruel training methods involved in getting them to perform in these activities, and sometimes even to the extent of actually removing the, the teeth so that they don't inflict bite wounds. When they're when they're earning money for their keeper, so this is this is a fairly major welfare issue. So really, just to conclude, um, primates are highly highly intelligent animals. They have really complex um, social groups, and they benefit from long periods of maternal dependency within their social group. They have very specific welfare and husbandry needs which cannot be provided adequately in, in a home pet environment. And they have been identified by many leading primatologists to be inappropriate for pet ownership. Countries including Belgium, Sweden, Mexico and India, and at least 20 of the US states have now banned any new ownership of primates. And there are many um, animal welfare organisations leading campaigns, including the Jane Goodall Institute, who are calling for a complete ban in the uh, keeping of primates as pets. So um, thank you all for your attention today. I hope that was something a little bit um, different and hopefully interesting for you, just to consider uh, some of the kind of wildlife aspects of, of animal welfare and also just to consider these, these amazing animals and what we can do to try and improve things for them. The picture down below is uh, one that I took uh, when visiting Sariska Tiger Reserve in India. These are wild um, common langurs and you can see them living in their, their nice little social group 
um, the young animal is getting lots of maternal dependency from the mother and there's some communal grooming going on and this is what we should be seeing in, in primates. And although what we've really spoken about today is focused on, on pets, um, everything that we've mentioned can actually be, be transferred into uh, more appropriate keeping facilities and um, zoos and, and reserves and things to improve the, the welfare of those animals um, through environmental enrichment. So I did mention there were a few um, references that have went into producing this talk. So I'll just spend a few seconds on, on each slide so that if you do have the recording, um, if you're interested in any of these, there are some web links to some of the organizations that I've discussed and some of the information that we've provided. And there'll be a little bit of time if anyone has, has any questions. As I said, um, I'm not a wildlife vet, so it will just be relating to the behaviour side of things. Then there's a little bit of time we can have some questions. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Inga, for such an insightful presentation. Like always, it's so good to have you. So if you have any questions, uh, participants, you can unmute yourself or you can use the chat box for some question. Bima, are you going to read out from the chat box or do you want me to go through that or? Uh, yeah, I can take that question, yeah. Okay. So maybe Pratik, could you have some questions? If you have, you can unmute yourself. Uh, uh, hello, uh, am I audible? Uh, yes. Yes. Uh, so hello, Dr. Inga, uh, I am Pratik Kizu and I have a query about uh, wildlife farming. So uh, there have been news of uh, wildlife farming all across the globe. Uh, so how the wildlife farming will stand uh, stand by side with uh, the wildlife welfare uh, as the world as the world wildlife farming is uh, contradicts in itself. So did you get me? Okay, so I, I think just just to clarify there, you are you're asking about wild wildlife farming. Was that right? Yeah, yeah, I was asking yeah. about wildlife farming. Yeah. Okay, so I think I think really the importance of that comes back to the slide that we discussed about with with both welfare and and ethics. Okay, so there will be there will be people who are against wildlife farming. Indeed, there will be people who are against uh, domestic animal farming, and there will be people who are are for or against you know zoos, which which do actually provide some uh, positive things to conservation, but some people may not like those animals being kept captive. So what I would say is when we are faced with, with situations, what we have to look upon is to be able to separate our ethical view from what we know about animal welfare. So I think it's irrespective whether you agree or, or disagree with, with wildlife farming. The question is, can we do something to improve the welfare of those animals? So good welfare is associated with providing that animal a good life and a pain-free day. And, and that in itself is not a welfare concern um, if those needs are met. It may go against your ethical beliefs, but there are things that we can do. Um, and many, you know, many wildlife involved in, in some types of farming, and I think will probably have very poor welfare. I'm not suggesting it's 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 all fine, but there are things that we can do um, that can improve the welfare for those animals because if it's something that we don't agree with ethically that may take a very long time to change and it may not even be in, in our lifetime so we have to focus on what can we change for those animals during their lifetime so trying to educate people about welfare needs um, you know for for one example for instance um, and I'm not sure if this is what you mean but and um, for instance, the bear bile trade. Um, I think it's very widely accepted that these animals are kept in very poor conditions, um, normally in cramped, cramped cages with no ability for hardly any normal movement, let alone normal behavior. Um, so that would be one example of very poor welfare. Now we might not be able to change that trade, but we can in the interim perhaps try to improve the welfare of those animals during their lifetime. Um, some of the things we want to change and improve in the world are a long, long journey. And we sometimes have to look at what we can do now for those animals during their lifetime. So, 
not sure if that answered your question. I hope it I hope it addressed a little bit of what you were asking. So I think uh, it did answer his question. So Dr. Inga, let's move on to another question we have on a chat box and it's from Ivu de Quota. Uh, she says, hi, Dr. Inga, how do you I respond? <laughs> how do you respond to people when they accuse us of being anti-human when we raise awareness about animal welfare? Uh, did you get it? I, I'll just bring up. I'll just bring up the chat box. Yeah, it's in the chat box. Yeah. Uh, oh, sorry. Oh, here we are. Sorry. Okay, so you're you're never going to keep everybody happy. Okay, and um, it's it's quite acceptable to have different opinions. Um, Bima can probably tell you we, we spend a little bit of, of time together uh, traveling, doing some extra extra help for my project last time we met. And we had some some fairly complex and, and difficult discussions about some animal welfare things that I think we probably had different opinions on. Um, a lot of times when you criticize uh, people's choices or behaviors or how they keep their animals, um, it's going to evoke some some defensiveness in them. And I, I think all you can do is try to have a balanced view. And, and I also, you know, your, your opinion is, is not necessarily right in, in every aspect. Um, so I think one, you know, one, one big thing about that will be, um, you know, I know some of you are kind of passionate uh, vegetarianism and, and veganism. And, you know, that, that's, that's, that's great. And I think it's a, a positive thing for, for animals. But again, it comes back to the thing about the ethics and the welfare. And all we can do is, is try to raise awareness and you're not going to, to make everybody happy all of the time. And even within, within these groups, there will be differences of opinions. So I think it's always important to respect people's opinions. A lot of um, the uses of animals and a lot of it can come from very deep seated cultural history and you have to be very aware and very considerate of that. Um, you may not agree with some things, but again, trying to educate people in a positive manner is far more likely to uh, invoke positive change than being critical and you know setting up barriers. So we want to break down barriers, um, and that's why I'm, I'm bringing up things like you know like uh, you know uses of animals. If you want to improve situation for you know, farm animals or, or wildlife. You have to be able to engage in positive communication with the people involved in that. And, and that often can make a significant difference to, to the animals involved. So again, from an animal welfare point of view, we're looking at good welfare, having welfare needs meet, met during their life. And when it comes to the end of that life, whether that be natural or by some other means, um, a humane and a pain-free death. And these are the things that are within our control. Um, the longer term uh, battles that some people may have over, over ethics are, are much, much longer term. So I, I think there's no easy way to respond to people who are being critical of you. But what I would recommend is that, that you try to make your approach non-critical of them, um, but to be an informative and, and to try to educate as you can. And, and we should not, you know, we should not let differences be barriers. We have to be respectful of, of people's opinions, people's heritage and people's choices. We don't have to agree on them. Um, we might not agree on one topic, but that doesn't mean that we can't come together and collaborate on a lot of other topics. So we always have to um, appreciate and respect differences, know our own values and behave to our own values and, and try our best to, to share those opinions in a, in a positive way. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. I think that was the answer I was looking for. Okay, great. It's very difficult and it can be frustrating because sometimes we have very strong opinions and some of the things that we see and we deal with are, are really, you know, up, upsetting and uh, weigh a lot on our mind and our conscience. Um, so sometimes it's hard to show respect for people who are maybe doing something that you have very strong opinions about, but we, we have to always try to take that higher ground and we're much more likely to achieve more with, with that sort of approach. Okay, thank you.
now I can see the next question, I think, Dima, which is about cats grooming, which yeah. is a really great, a really great question, actually. Um, and that's that's one thing that's actually very important about we, what we said about normal activity time budgets. So for a domestic cat, and domestic cats really are, are the epitome of getting to do what you want. Cats do what they want, when they want. And if you look at cats in any environment, they spend a huge amount of their time sleeping and grooming. So for cat, those are completely normal behaviors. If you didn't know what was normal for a cat, you might think, oh, they're over grooming, there is a problem. There is evidence of over grooming in cats. Sometimes it can get to the point um, in my small animal work, we do sometimes see cats who will over groom themselves. Um, sometimes it can be through pain, you know, so if they have a sore joint, they might groom and groom and groom that area. Um, and sometimes it can be to do with stress of, of housing condition or um, cats are a little bit the, the opposite of primates. Some cats can become very stressed if kept with, with large numbers of, of multi cats in households. So occasionally it can tip into the problem side where they actually uh, start to cause injury to the skin. But as, as, a, as a more general rule, you know, I would say comparing, comparing to what we were talking about in primates, the, the normal grooming behavior is, is actually quite appropriate. Um, as, a far, as far as what approaches we can provide as vets, um, again, I think you have to strip things back and look at the, the husbandry. So if, for instance, um, I don't know what, what the situation is for you, we do have some what we call multi-cat owners um, here where I work. And sometimes that can involve people with um, you know, the very, very best intentions, real cat lovers who may have, you know, 10 plus cats in a household. And for some cats, that's actually highly stressful and it can cause problems, um, not just with, with over grooming, but it can cause aggression and fighting um, and sometimes a, a syndrome of uh, stress urinary tract disease, so cystitis in cats as well is a stress response. So we have to question and understand the husbandry and see if we can improve upon that by you know, giving some cats more space, perhaps giving them outdoor access if they're kept completely in the house. And there are some medications, um, I don't know if you will have them or be familiar with them, there are some pheromone treatments and um, something called Felloway which I can send you a link to if you're not familiar with it. These are kind of natural environmental remedies to try and address stress in cats. I don't know if anybody wants to come, come back on that. So maybe Dr. Inga, we can go to another question and I'll follow up that for Parik uh, Shadidi, okay. Perfect. Yeah, there are a few a few cat medications and, and those uh, pheromones I can send some information on. So there's a question here uh, from Prakash, which is, since we have many concerns regarding keeping primates in captivity, what may be the alternatives to conserve some critically endangered primates? So again, that, that's a really good question and one which we, we briefly just sort of touched upon that this presentation was um, more directed towards the actual keeping of primates as, as pets. So someone keeping a primate in their individual household, which we are seeing is, is, is really considered in this day and age to be, to be not a good choice for primates. Um, there are situations where primates can be kept in, in very good welfare conditions. And again, our, some of our best um, zoos and safari parks actually do, um, and this is what I was just touching on when I said, you know, ethically, you might not agree with keeping animals in captivity, but some well-run um, zoos and conservation projects are actually essential to learning more about these animals, to having captive breeding programs, and potentially even to having, um, you know, some reserve, uh, sorry, reserve capacity of endangered animals because we are losing species at, at a frightening rate through um, you know, deforestation, loss of habitat, um, disease spillover, human wildlife conflict. There is a lot of concerns against um, wildlife and their conservation. And the actual um, appropriate keeping of these animals in a captive environment 
does have a role to play in the long-term conservation of species. Um, there are some, some very good examples of some very good environmental enrichment for a number of different species um, where you know, even some of our, our large cat predators and um, different feeding techniques to provide them proper stimulation and to provide them proper exercise in their habitat. Um, I, saw, I, saw, I saw a video, I think it was from uh, an organization in London where they had a uh, captive um, African wild dogs and they had a simulated hunting feeding where they actually had a, had a, a a chase, not, not a live animal chase, but a chase to involve in their feeding. So again, this was part of the environmental enrichment to try and provide a more natural environment for our captive animals. So there are situations where it's, there are positives to keeping them in captivity, but it should be done in the correct way. So if animals are social animals, they should have the access to social groups. They should be provided the correct diet in the correct fashion. So if they are foragers or like to work, work for their food and, and solve that, that should take up part of their daytime budget. What they shouldn't do is be kept in a, you know, in a barren cage with, with no, you know, cage furniture and no stimulation and no enrichment. So I think the understanding of, of animals and their um, wild behaviours can lead us to, to being able to provide an appropriate captive environment. And that can be done with good welfare in the, in the right situations. Does that answer okay, Prakash? So he does reply in the comments. Thank you, Dr. McDermott, oh, for your wonderful presentation. Yeah. So it's further down, so I'm just, I'm just reading through them. Um, okay. So let's see. So um, from, from Harry, it may be out of subject, but one major problem we are facing here in rural areas of Nepal is wild primates destroying crops of farmers, which is causing huge brutal conflict between humans and primates. How to solve this problem? So yep, th this, is a, this is a really complex problem. Um, I probably don't know quite enough about primate medicine to cover this fully, but I, 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 there's something I'll touch upon that I did hear about from someone else. But this is one of the situations of human wildlife conflict. Um, and this is the case for, for many species and has come about as a result of a, a number of factors. So the first factor is we have a very, very rapidly um, growing human population. And over, over time, that has involved in the loss of a lot of natural habitats of wildlife. So we've had deforestation, We've had areas of altered land use, so you know, land taken over for farming or for different types of production, palm oil production, etc. And we also have some problems with um, you know, actual waste and garbage control, and that can lead to a lot of scavenging behaviour from primates as well. Um, so the, the large number of primates are, are a problem, and there's you know, some supplementary feeding involving that as well. Um, I'm not sure the exact solutions. I did, um, I attended a wildlife course in India and one of the participants on my course did a presentation and they were actually um, carrying out, she showed us a video, it was amazing, um, laparoscopic neutering of primates. And part of that was to control the population in, in key areas. So there is some work being done um, as I say, I'm, I'm not a primate vet, so I don't know if there's been, you know, some of the developments. We are obviously working quite a lot on, on the dog population side of things, and there are, you know, new developments coming through about immunocontraceptives, things like that. Um, you know, ultimately, some, some numbers may have to be controlled, and those sorts of methods are a more humane way of, of controlling those numbers. Um, but I don't know all the answers to that, but that's some, some things for consideration. But the human wildlife conflict is, is definitely a, an issue, and an issue that has to be approached with consideration for all parties, um, because crop raising and, and loss of crops is, is very, very important. You know, people rely on that. Um, and for some of the, the larger wildlife animals, you know, can can often even lead to loss of life. So it, it's a very big problem and one that has to have a, a balanced view um, to finding solutions. So there's a message from uh, Kiran. 
which is recently many rhesus monkeys from temples have been captured and released to the wilder hilly areas. Does this justify welfare, welfare since it's resulting in the conflict? Um, so I, I'm not familiar with that, these exact situations that you're describing. Um, there are sometimes situations of you know, relocation or translocation of animals. There needs to be appropriate research into the release sites. So first of all, there needs to be an appropriate release site that has the capacity to hold those animals. There is no point in, in just moving a problem from one area to another. Um, so I don't know what, what work was done to actually look at um, the suitability of the areas of release, um, but moving animals can risk you know, spread of disease, can result in other conflict, either with other animals or indeed with, with people. And um, so there does need to be long-term plans to look at um, overall population control and what you're trying to achieve from that relocation. So there needs to be a proper end goal in sight um, as to whether that's a good measure or not, because there can be positives and, and negatives associated with it. Um, and conflict, conflict is a huge, a huge issue um, because there's, there, there's just not enough um, natural environment left for wildlife um, so there, there is there is a lot of issues with that and the solutions are, are not easy and they have to satisfy both the needs of, of people and the needs of, of animals so we have to look for long-term sustainable change there okay so i think probably we just time wise, we've maybe got another sort of five or 10 minutes before I need to go, if that's okay. So I'll just see what else. I think there's a couple of questions I'll just try and go through quite quickly. Um, so from Amik. Uh, so Amik, I think your question was maybe answered up above about the zoos. Um, you know, there, there, there is a place for it and there is some, some positives to conservation that can be achieved by zoo environments. But I think the, the efforts for welfare are, again, understanding what their welfare needs are and trying to, you know, trying to improve upon that. There is quite a wee bit of information, the reference links that I've, I've attached on how we can improve the, the husbandry and the environmental um, enrichment of these animals in situations where they are kept in captivity. So hopefully we've already answered that one. Um, And for, for birds, you know, I th yeah, I think the same goes again. I mean, ultimately, it's it's down to to space, and you know, disease risks and their their you know their normal behaviours. Um, I'm not as I'm not as um, experienced in in bird keeping actually, but again, overcrowded enclosures and and the source of birds. A lot of exotic birds are captured from the wild, and they're captured in quite cruel methods. Um, sometimes almost with these kind of glue type traps. That you know, glue is is wound around trees, and the birds are then caught on that, and and that's how the trade is supplied. So we really have to look at where these animals are coming from. Um, have they been caught in a? You know, animals shouldn't be getting caught from the wild and, and brought into these situations, unless they are you know about to become extinct, and it's a very very well thought out conservation program. Um, but there is a huge problem with illegal trade and illegal sourcing of animals from, from the wild. And those have, have major welfare concerns, both in the catching of animals, the transportation, and ultimately then you know, the education of who ends up with them. So you know, all, all of these are, are big aspects. Um, The laboratory question well I, I don't know all the answers to that one um, primates have long been used in laboratory research because they are our closest relatives um, it's a really difficult really difficult question a lot of people will, will disagree with it um, there's also been huge advances in human medicine as a, as a result of it again I think from the welfare point of view um, those animals' lives should be as, as high welfare as, as possible. And, and certainly historically, some of that would, would be questionable. There has been a lot of um, advances in um, pharmaceutical research. There are a lot of things that can now be um, you know, carried out on, on different tissue cultures and things. I'm not a laboratory scientist, but I would very much hope in time that these activities on, on live animals that are, are 
enormous capacity for development will take us beyond that where where there are alternatives um yeah that's it's a very difficult one okay i think is so, that most questions anyway i think that was the last question dr inga okay, okay so um i think we're done with questions as well so with that, uh, thank you so much, Dr. Inga. It's always, always good to have you. Like the knowledge is always overpowering from yourself. And like you said, knowledge is contagious and we have to pass it. And it's always motivating and inspiring. Yeah. So thank you. We no, are very grateful to have you much. today. Thank you all so much for giving up some time years after this afternoon. And um, I hope you could hear everything okay and that that was helpful. If there was any issues with the connection or um, the audio, I can I can send you a separate recording. But hopefully it was useful, and it was lovely to to see and hear from some of you again. Okay. With that, I think we can end our meeting and have a good evening. Thank you all. Thank you all for having us. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Bye bye.